Production Studies, Cultural Studies of Media Industries by Vicki Mayer, Miranda J. Banks, and John T. Caldwell. Chapter 1, Bringing the Social Back In, Studies of Production Cultures and Social Theory, Vicki Mayer. As a field of study, quote, production studies, end quote, captures for me the ways that power operates locally through media production to reproduce social hierarchies and inequalities at the level of daily interactions. Production studies, in other words, quote, ground, end quote, social theories by showing us how specific production sites, actors, or activities tell us larger lessons about workers, their practices, and the role of their labors in relation to politics, economics, and culture. It is this connection between the micro context and the macro forces which illuminates the social implications in an otherwise narrow case study and modifies the grand claims that have become commonplace regarding the role of media in society. It is also this connection between macro and micro that is so frequently lost in the efforts to describe the current media landscape, its interconnected industries, and its networks of professionals. It is ironic that as media industries continue to aggregate and dominate larger labor markets and audience shares, fewer production studies have actually addressed the real ways that local communities construct their subjectivities in the face of these consolidations of media capital and reconfigurations of media work. Social theory was not always divorced from local realities. From the 1930s to the early 1950s, a series of international scholars, many of whom published in the United States, tried to envision how media workers experienced the growth of a cinematic industrial complex based in Hollywood and its attempts to harness and control labor power. Written at a time when Many Americans were already deeply skeptical about the growing commercialization of culture and the threats of propaganda, both political and economic. These early folk, fo- these early foci on producers in, or foci on producers and production belied the desire for a holistic sense of how production and consumption intertwine in the lives of real people. They documented how alienation, a Marxist concept, concept from or found in his economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, operated to estrange people from the value of the things they made. For Marx, the bigger and more economically powerful a product was after its production, the more the workers who made it suffered. In the process, their work was devalued, erased by the value of a product they had no control over distributing. More importantly, Marx highlighted the fact that modern capitalist societies require workers who recognize their that their physical means and sus- subsistence subsistence depended or depend on this political economic system of creating wealth for others. This second characteristic of alienated labor is what made Hollywood workers such an apropos case study. Movies were arguably the most powerful products a or the United States produced through a vast economy of laborers whose existence depended upon this product, which surpassed the value of the labor and devalued the work of the laborer. Looking back on early media production studies, we can see the ways that Leo Rostin and Hortense Powdermaker, in particular, theorized the concept of alienation through their empirical studies of Hollywood labor, work practices, and subjective experience. Although shifts in the global political economy from production based to consumer based has rendered some of Marx's insights obsolete. It is his attempt to relate political economy to the formation of subjectivities that seems still useful to ponder today. In this chapter, I argue that we can still theorize alienation, but that it must come through empirical cases that contribute a broader understanding of work experience in light of what luck Balten, Baltinsky, Balten, 
or Baltansky and Eve Schiapello called the, quote, new spirit of capitalism, end quote. The zeitgeist that encompasses the present realities of capitalist production. To illustrate, I draw upon a single event in a longer ethnography of reality television casters as a new worker category in the television industry. The event, a casting call that failed to attract any participants, reveals some of the central ways in which local production studies might theorize forms of alienation in a grounded way and why television workers labor to erase all traces of these theoretically productive moments. Social theory in two early production studies. Leo Rostin's study of 1930s Hollywood begins with a simple restatement of division between superstructure and base, or the difference between the opulence of movies and the material conditions that produce them. Like other worker communities, Hollywood is a social, not geographic, entity, but unlike them, the public aura or the public aura of their symbolic product, or I'll read it back, but unlike them, the public aura of their symbolic product shadows the real processes of capital accumulation. Quote, the public never sees J.P. Morgan making money or Henry Ford making cars, but it does see actor Robert Taylor making faces, end quote. This equivalence between money, cars, and faces is the basis for the alienation where thousands of workers are anonymous, quote, in the shadow, end quote, of a product with more value and power in the global economy than themselves. Hollywood merely indexed the national split between estranged labor and its objectified forms. While certainly not radical in his disposition, Rostin was centrally concerned with the dialectic between workers' material conditions and their subjectivities. World War II, the closure of European film markets, and the enforcement of antitrust laws laid bare a political economy that accelerated capital accumulation. Quote, the manufacturer of movies substituted the problem of selling a commodity for the problem of, quote, having a wonderful time, end quote. Hollywood was forced, more or less, to shift its attention from the Arabian Nights to Dunn and Broad Street, end quote. Driven by profit motives, workers now sought individualistic or individualist goals that emphasize competition over solidarity and strategic alliances over organic community. The, objecti the objectification of their labor extended to self-objectification, in which elites con consciously realized the need to produce or to promote their own celebrity through extravagant spending and highly public conjugal relations. Elites, quote, cease to be individuals and become business institutions, end quote, writes Rostin, who interestingly observes them as the most alienated class, paid far below business elites and less powerful than political elites. Hollywood elites seem to have an, quote, unconscious need for anxiety, end quote, that kept them swinging between elation and despair, unable to assess their own value except through income and status comparisons. Elites worked long hours but were perennially dissatisfied and discontent. This insight that alienation was tied to the production process over the social class of the worker continued to be a dominant theme in Hortense Powdermaker's ethnography of Hollywood in the late 1940s. Like Rostin, Powdermaker's or Powdermaker found workers motivated first by profits, especially at the top of production hierarchies, where, quote, the game becomes the ends and is played compulsively, end quote. In addition, though, she spent far more time with the workers at the bottom of these hierarchies, whose externalized labor rendered them as property that she compares to feudal serfs, African-American slaves, prostitutes, and indentured servants. Although Marx characterizes alienation as a state of being under modern capitalism, 
powder makers metaphors and their accompanying biographical stories of Hollywood actors writers and directors seem to show that profit is not the only value in a capitalist political economy rather Producers and executives often rejected a profitable employee in return for an imaginary ownership over the product. In this case, the studios hid net profits of films to exert greater control over their contracted producers, allowing executives to claim the product was, in fact, their creation. The key to ownership in Powder Maker's text is the lack of freedom that workers trade for success in the industry. Freedom is not a break from alienation. In particular, the estrangement that results from the division of labor, but seems to imply a role for workers to more openly collaborate in the labor process. When time rational. When time, rationalization, bureaucratic management, and commercial technologies displace the natural technologies of the self, quote, brains and talent, end quote. Powdermaker claims that producers deceive themselves into thinking of themselves as autonomous competitors rather than individuals tied together by their potential for creative expression and hard work. Her assertion that Freedom was not just desirable for many workers, but completely possible despite alienation seems to give insight into why some workers accepted exploitative conditions in exchange for a self-realization through, quote, a human form of collaboration, end quote. This obvious contradiction, alienation, but self-real self-realization through collaboration adds a layer to the social theories of the day, showing that capitalism would be even more effective if it allowed workers to collaborate to realize each individual's organic talents. Powdermaker and Rostin contribute empirical evidence to social theorizing of the era, most notably the piercing critique found in Max Horkenheimer and Theodore Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment. For them, alienation connected production and consumption, succeeding in, quote, sacrificing whatever involved a distinction between the logic of the work and that of the social system, end quote. Workers participate in an increasingly efficient industrial system of mass production and consumption, making them eventually, quote, redundant as producers, end quote of standardized objects and the liberal ideology of individual merit, competition, and desire. Elites control these processes of material and social standardization, while also reaffirming their unflinching allegiance to the system. On these points alone, Rostin's and Powdermaker's studies extend Horkenheimer and Adorno's perceptions of alienation. First, they showed how different types of producers in Hollywood experienced alienation differently. Indeed, Rostin's elites were, in many ways, the most alienated. Second, these authors envisioned collective modes of creative ownership over production that would allow more control over the process while embedding them deeper in a system still driven by alienated labor and motives. In this respect, Powdermaker, the anthropologist, not the social theorist, is almost prescient in foregrounding the current era of team-based production and flexible work conditions that simultaneously liberate and harness creativity to generate profits. She predicts, quote, to liberate the unused resources of talent in Hollywood entails changes in the way of thinking in the system of production which reflects the way of thinking and, finally, in the allocation of power." End quote. Compare these grounded theories of the dialectics of subjective formations and material exploitations with the relative lack of class critique today in the new lexicon of production studies, producers frequently, quote, negotiate, end quote, their way through, quote, complex, end quote, social networks that all have more or less the same status and power. Producers are still anxious in studies that chart processes from the making of a documentary to the selling of a television series. But workers are also more likely to have independent agency 
and feel vindicated by a successful final product. In part, the political economy of the industry has changed. Film and television industry simultaneously promote teamwork and flexibility while espousing piecework and outsourcing. Creative production has been industrialized per Horkenheimer and Adorno, but the production processes resemble more a bygone, bygone era of bohemian artist than the individuated factory floor. In their discussion of these material shifts, Luck Baltansky and Eve Schiapello propose that a new spirit of capitalism has stifled intellectual social critique by co-opting the language of 1960s liberation into managerial speak. Block quote. Success in this new spirit, autonomy, spontaneity, rhizomorphousness, rhizomorphousness, capacity, multitasking, in contrast to the narrow specialization in the old division of labor, conv conviviality, openness to others, and novelty, availability, creativity, visionary institution, sensitivity to differences, listening to lived, expe to lived experience and receptiveness to a whole range of experiences, being attracted to inform informality and the search for interpersonal contacts. These are taken directly from the repertoire of May 1968, but these themes, which in the text of the May movement, were combined with a radical critique of capitalism, are often to be found in the neo-management literature, autonomized, as it were, represented as obje objectives that are valid in their own right and placed in the service of forces whose destruction they were intended to hasten. The critique of the division of labor, of hierarchy and supervision, that is to say, the way industrial capitalism alienates freedom, is thus detached from the critique of market alienation, of oppression by impersonal market forces. End of block quote. In one way, we might speculate that the new economy for film and television co-opted the values of artists and powder makers' era and turned them profitable, thus silencing critique from many who framed alienation in terms of factory work and assembly line production. In another way, though, the problem of social theorizing might also be a methodological issue. Rostin and Powdermaker, as other chapters in this volume develop more fully, had a special access to Hollywood's production personnel. Rostin worked in the industry. Powdermaker entered it on her own. In contrast, much of our work today comprises interviews on the phone or electronic correspondences, methods that open considerable distance between the su what subjects say about themselves and what they do. Observational methods are similarly limited. Executives give access to researchers to, to emphasize commercial successes and obscure failures. Corporate events are staged in spaces and at times when networks, advertisers, and trade industries celebrate themselves to gain market advantage and position themselves against competitors. Given these difficulties, the job of building social theories grounded in the local experiences of practitioners seems as much a question of finding case studies that illustrate the times and places where the unexpected occurs in the rhetoric of achievement is called into question. Such was the case of a 2007 casting call in which I was a participant observer. The casting call as a case study in alienation. I wanted to go to a casting call to witness what I had been interviewing workers about for over two years at this point. I was interested in reality casters, that is, the workers who cast the people that we eventually see under the broad umbrella of reality television programs. Reality casters are a prime example of invisible labor. Their work is objectified in the cast member whose value is measured in ratings and advertising rates that can never be passed back to the caster. 
Production companies rarely even acknowledge the work of the caster in the form of program ending credits, which themselves have become illegible video streams alongside previews for other programs. Despite these mechanisms of alienation, casters and phone interviews were largely sequined about their efforts. Its value to the television industry and their experience of the daily routines, their of the of the daily routines. When the opportunity arose for me to attend a live casting call of a participant observer, I jumped to attend. I wanted to see how well the reality of the work matched with interviewees' self appraisals of their work. Like many casting calls, the one or this one had to be organized quickly and somewhat at the last minute. The program succeeded in its extension through the television season. From the original nine episodes to 13, the producers were elated, but suddenly they would need four more episodes in an abbreviated time frame. From the initial three months of production now to a single month, Christmas holidays were looming and there would be few opportunities to get cast members if the production team did not quick did not act quickly. Quote Andrew, end quote, a casting associate for the program, felt the pressure. This is the time I get nervous. Or quote, this is the time I get nervous, end quote, he told me. Quote, there's always the risk that no one shows and the affiliate puts all this work into the event for nothing, end quote. The fear that labor would be wasted is a very real risk in assessing the value of a casting call. Television network affiliates frequently help production companies organize casting calls in the hope that a local person will be selected for the cast. The local person is a commodity that boosts affiliates' advertising rates for the program and can be tied to promotional events for the station. One classic example, Fox News affiliates frequently chronicle the progress of local contestants on their network's program, American Idol. In turn, the network program often broadcasts these local outpourings of emotion for the local contestant at planned fan parties and welcome home gatherings sponsored by the affiliates. The longer the local stays in the program, the higher the exchange value for the affiliates. The search for a local cast member is therefore a type of lottery for numerous workers who gauge their own success on the chance that their work could be objectified in the form of a contestant, character, or participant who not only appeared at the, on the screen, but might reappear. This economy was the basis for workers' anxieties throughout the production team, broadcast worker, broadcast networks and their affiliates, as well as the foundation for guaranteed alienation from the product of their labors. The anxiety was palpable around this particular call, which targeted families with small children. I arrived well ahead of the 3 p.m. start time to a kids' daycare facility, one in which upper middle class families bought memberships so, their, so that their children had a designated play space in their large urban environment in which they grew up. Andrew's team and the local television affiliates had convinced the owner of the facility that by hosting the call, they would cross-promote the daycare company. The owner, quote Jeff, end quote, said he expected no less than 30 families as he cleared two spaces in the kitchen area, one table for interviews and another for those queued to interview. On the first table, Andrew had neatly arranged pens and applications. He searched for chairs and made phone calls to the television affiliate contacts. Quote, Natalie, end quote, Jeff's employee, had laid out a small spread or had laid out a spread of cookies, crackers, juice boxes, and other snacks for at least 50 attendees on the second table. She also inflated helium balloons and decorated, decorated the entire warehouse space with streamers. Jeff placed a life-size standee from the program at the front door with signs he had commissioned from the local company or from the local copy shop. Nervously, he chewed 
out the mail service representative that had guaranteed that 20 copies of the book authored by the program's host would arrive in time. Jeff had invested several hundred dollars in accessorizing the call. He said he just wanted, quote, to break even, end quote, to justify his investment. But he spent the afternoon talking about how much the event cost and how he hoped to generate new customers and turn a profit to justify the work. Quote, I think we'll have at least 30 families today, end quote. Jeff said again, repeating his sanguine prediction, but perhaps less sure of himself this time. Andrew was less optimistic on this point, guessing that perhaps five families would attend the call. He knew, for, he knew from experience that families were a difficult demographic, if only because it required the target audience to coordinate their schedules and travel to a remote location. Further, it was the first cold snap of the winter in the city, making an outdoor excursion even less likely. We sat down at the interview table and waited. The or a news camera, a news cameraman for the affiliate station who arrived to record the expected crowd also waited. Quote, if there's a fire, I'm out of here, end quote, he stated. But three hours later, we were all still there. Not a single applicant came to the casting call. Jeff was distraught, having spent weeks on preparation and invested income on the event no one came to. The cameraman was bored flipping through children's books in the play area. Even Andrew, who was upbeat in his interactions with me, was now disappointed, having incorrectly predicted that his efforts would bear results. Although he did not expect a crowd, he hoped that applicants would at least call into the daycare to inquire about the call. The only product produced after four people worked for five hours that day was a videotape of Jeff's three children, Andrew and me watching an episode of the program itself on television. The cameraman delivered the tape to the affiliate newsroom for the evening's late night broadcast. The invisible and ultimately unproductive labors of workers for the production company, the television affiliates, and the daycare, as well as the owner, belied the obvious aspects of alienated labor involved in many, if not most, casting calls. Quite simply, a lot of time and effort goes to waste in finding, quote, real people, end quote, that could just as easily be found next door at the supermarket or in the shopping mall. The exchange value of the call relates more to whether local media industries can capitalize on an on-screen participant as a brand, something that may have no relation to the efforts of those involved with casting calls. Instead, the process of the casting call and its reception by the people I observed gives some insights into the alienation or gives some insights into how alienation makes working subjects. This particular casting call demanded coordination and collaboration between various types of workers, which in the beginning seemed full of potential and enthusiasm, but ultimately resulted in boardroom or resulted in boredom and some isolation as workers faced the individual consequences of the call's failure. The clear separation of the production process from the product created anxiety and then disappointment when the process failed to produce the applicant the applicants. At another level, though, the business owner, Jeff, most embodied these emotions. He clearly felt the most at stake in attracting publicity, so much so he commodified his own kin in a staged news clip. In contrast, Andrew, who felt pressure to deliver participants for the program, could also look to other mechanisms for gathering applicants, such as phone calls and the news clip itself, which would promote calls to the production base in Hollywood. Quote, people will see the episode tonight and then the news story that we want local families, end quote, he said. Quote, after the program airs, we can get 100 to 200 calls. So this event is part of outreach, end quote. Whereas alienation made for nervous workers throughout the operation, calling attention to their lack of control over the object, the investments in each person's role still led to individuated experiences of the event, creating tensions. 
Another factor that might help us to understand these tensions were the trajectories of these workers, in particular Jeff and Andrew. The former had a career in hotel management to become a business owner. The latter was an artist by training, working as a casting director to support his primary goal. Both talked about these alternative careers during the long wait for applicants. Andrew stressed, quote, I really do this to pay the bills, end quote. In contrast, Jeff said he, quote, put everything, end quote, into the business. Quote, my years in hospitality are the basis for what I am trying to do here, end quote. While this might be a facile comparison, it is also possible to see how media industries manage alienation by spreading the risk of failure through organizational networks. Production studios benefit when they hire workers who can defer their insecurities either to other collaborators or to other pursuits outside of the industry. Of course, these insecurities return, as in the nagging feeling that Andrew had at the beginning of the event. Yet, the object lesson of the casting call might be how failure in the production process has the power to reveal workers' alienation to themselves, but the industry structure also gives them the alibis for explaining it away. Again, workers experience this differently. The younger casting director still hoped his art would be the path from alienation, explaining away the failure of the day as a step toward unification with an artist community, while the older business owner narrated the success of this event as an indicator of whether his skills from the hospitality industry could help him achieve his own financial independence. Productive theorizing from production failures, question mark. Alienation seems to be a continuing feature of modern production, whether in the refurbished industrial space of a daycare or in the post-industrial practices of the reality caster waiting for the next contract. Production studies offer the opportunity not just to confirm the ongoing presence of this social phenomenon locally, but theorize from the ground how it, quote, works, end quote, making producers into productive subjects. Television programs, the result of hundreds of microprocesses, from script writing to distribution, rely on thousands of collaborative efforts. But without some form of fieldwork, it's hard to know how these collaborations manifest to make workers accept the fact that the arrangements result in uncompensated labors. While one case study cannot illuminate the range of possible experiences of alienation, it can become one of the building blocks for a theory that shows the variations among workers based on their role in a collaborative project, their career trajectory, and their future opportunities. This is an opportunity not to repackage the insights of the past or of past production studies, but to replace it in light of a new economy of television and film production. The casting call seemed to present alienation not just in flashes of recognition that the work was devalued, usurped, or erased, but also in the deferral of the next project. For this reason, local production studies might also focus more on failures in the production process, what did not work or go well according to industrial standards. Not only are the failures simply necessary for defining success, they can be productive in themselves as a critique of capitalism. Failures, as Judith Halberstam has noted, open the potential for reimagining resistance as a queer space, not quite submissive, but not quite revolutionary either. In the in this sense, the casting call in this sense, the casting call that failed to attract attention was precisely the moment that revealed the work of casters to justify the failure, create an alternative narrative of the event, and move on. Still a chap still a resistant ugh, still a resistive spark remained. Despite his enthusiasm for the job and the optimism for the future, Andrew complained that at times his job seemed quote thankless end quote to him quote 
I've cast shows where I don't even get invited to the final rap party, end quote. If alienation operates to disconnect ro- workers from their labors, we see in Andrew's comment a recognition and a rejection of any starry-eyed admiration for the industry, perhaps sowing a seed for future resistance. And I was reading chapter one, bringing the social back in studies of production cultures and social theory by Vicki Mayer in production studies, cultural studies of media industries by Vicki Mayer, Miranda J. Banks and John T. Caldwell.